Good morning. <coughs> we got a card in the mail from Laura and Travis. I just wanted to read it to you. You can uh, come and look at it afterwards. Uh, it's JCC family. Hope this finds you all well and happy and warm. Thank you for continuing to be such a blessing to us. Your prayers, mentoring, laughs, teachings, yay YouTube, and love are treasured. You are missed, Laura and Travis. So, um, I know a number of you have been in touch with them since they moved to Colorado, uh, but they uh, still consider this their home church. And, and we're, I'm, I'm kind of praying selfishly that maybe one day God would bring them back home. So, um, <clears throat> I do have an ask the pastor question. Uh, again, the person that wrote it is not here. It seems like we're missing each other. But I'm going to go ahead and read it to you and answer it, and then I will just give this to them when, they, uh, when I see them next. Um, question is, I used to put cash in the offering when I could, but after your message on tithing, I have been, uh, I have been every month. However, recently, I've been feeling conflicted because my family has had to help me with the car expenses, tires, etc. Uh, I then feel a little guilty giving my tithe. My son, uh, I'm not sure what this says. Um, I have been able to get along for years on my social security. It is now X amount of dollars. Everything has gone up, rent, insurance, groceries, as well as medications. Uh, I just had to go on a very expensive prescription for diabetes. I'm sure you've faced the same problems. I know it is God's money first, but my question is, should I tithe and need help, or do I fail, or do I fall into the widow category? Your view on this would be very helpful. Um, you know, interestingly enough, Scripture deals with this subject very specifically. Um, first part of my answer is, yeah, it's God's money first, so we give him what he requires. Okay? It, it's all his. He has asked for 10% back. But she has a very real problem. Okay? And, and uh, we, we oftentimes, we, we speak in a spiritual sense of the blessings that God is going to pour out on us. But, but we have to live day to day. And, and it's in the paying of the bills and the earning of money that, that we live. And, and yet, God foreknew this. And he addressed this in his word. Um, <clears throat> there are two issues that are being dealt with right here. The first one being tithe, which you all know where I stand on tithe. I, I believe that God has made it clear that as an act of faith, he wants us to return to him 10% right off the top. It's not a bill. It's not something you can put off and hope that he doesn't come calling. It's, it's something that he has actually challenged us to do. In uh, Malachi chapter 3, he actually says, test me in this. Okay. So as far as the tithes and, and the offerings go, the uh, tithes come right off the top. Okay. But she, she has a very real problem in, uh, now I'm not seeming to have enough money to meet all my bills. Um, Paul actually addresses this uh, actually, God addresses this uh, in Exodus chapter 22. He warns us about mistreating the widow and the orphan, lest we incur his wrath. Um, he says in Psalm 68 that he is a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows. In the New Testament, Paul tells us exactly how we should be treating our widows, those women who have no husband to take care of them. Uh, if you would turn with me in... Uh, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. <coughs> Paul is going to practical application for how we deal with each other in the church. Uh, he starts off in verse 1. He says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, 
older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. And then in verse 3, he says, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. Now, the, the passage goes on to talk to the church about how we deal with those who are widows and do not have family to take care of them. But that passage right there makes it very clear that God has an expectation that as we grow older, our children, and even in some cases our grandchildren, will pitch in to help take care of us. This is the way that God designed it. When we have children, we nurture, we care for them. As we get older, they turn that around and they nurture and care for us. So to answer her question, yes, you honor God with your tithe, and yes, you should expect help from your family. And, and God even goes so far as to say that if they are unwilling to do this, they're worse than an unbeliever. In that case, if, if the family is either unable or unwilling to help, then the church steps in and helps take care of the need. Got it? Yes. All right, excellent. <clears throat> so we have kind of been taking a look at holiness. Um, we talked a couple weeks ago about positional holiness, the fact that when Christ died for us, when we accepted Him as our Lord and Savior, we are automatically imputed with His righteousness. That when God looks at us, He sees the righteousness of, of Himself, not because of anything we've done, but because of what His Son has done. That's positional righteousness. That means we are holy before God. Well, holy simply means set apart, unique, different from the common. Okay? But then we also talked a little bit about positional or practical holiness. This is the walking out of our faith. This is the, the working out of our salvation. This is the process of sanctification where we learn as we go through life those things, those behaviors that God desires and those that He does not, those that He rejects. And, and so we talked about walking out our holiness, walking out our faith so that we might become more and more like Him in this life. Now, we do this with the understanding that we will never achieve perfection in this life. If we could achieve perfection on our own, we wouldn't need Christ. Okay? So, as, as mature as you get, you're never going to arrive at perfection. That's, that's what Christ has given us. He has given us perfection. And so, um, I've got a quiz for you. Uh, I've got a little test. So, Josh, if you would go ahead and put up slide one. <coughs> wow, that really changed color. Those are supposed to be gray. Can you guys tell me the difference between the left side and the right side? Which one? Which one's darker? Which one's lighter? The one on the right is darker. The one on the right is darker. Okay. Does anybody have any other thoughts? They're exactly the same. I just copied the, slot, the, the square and moved it over to the other side. Okay. Now, now let's go to slide number two. Can you tell me the difference between these two? Yeah. <laughs> Night and day. Night and day. <laughs> uh, that one's pretty easy, isn't it? Go back to slide one. <laughs> My test is this. This is, this is to get you thinking. How does the world see you? See, if we uh, say that the left side is the world, and go ahead and go to slide two so that we can get our example. The left side is the world. The right side is, is those who are found in Christ. They have a righteousness not their own. They have become perfect before God in holiness. Okay? So the left side is the world. The right side is those who are found in Christ. Go ahead and go back. 
Now they look gray. Uh, Maybe it's just the angle. Nope. If the left side is gray and the right side looks gray, how do we know the difference? You don't. How does the world know the difference? How, how can the world tell that you're actually the white yes. and, and not the black or, or the gray? Because, see, the world doesn't see itself as black. They, they, they don't really see themselves as, as, as being lost. That's, that's part of the condition that the Holy Spirit has come to reveal to us is our need for a Savior, our, our need to be found. Okay? And so I've got a, a couple of scriptures I want to read to you, and then we're just going to talk a little bit about how we look. Um, <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, oftentimes we hear this passage uh, related to being married. But I'm going to, I, I want to look at this and uh, touch on some points here. So I'm going to pick up in verse 14. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord does Christ has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have, verse uh, 1 of chapter 7, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Now, Paul is not telling us, let me address this first. Paul is not telling us to remove ourselves from the world. He's not telling us that we need to go into these conclaves that are completely isolated from the world and, and to have no interaction with them. We know from the ministry of Christ, we know from the commands of Christ, we know from the teachings and the example of the apostles that we are not to withdraw from the world. As a matter of fact, we are to go into the world. We are ambassadors of Christ, we are His representatives, so we are to go into the world taking the light into dark places. Okay, so, so let's establish that premise first so that we can understand this with the right understanding. Okay, because Scripture tells us that we are to come out from among them and be separate, but Scripture also tells us that I become all things to all men that I might win some for Christ. Okay, so, so there's not a, 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 an opposite of, of teaching going here. It's actually the same idea, except it's working on two different, different levels, two different principles. So in dealing with this, come out from among them and be separate. I think Paul is addressing, in, in much greater words than I could, the principle of gray and gray versus black and white. Now, how does this look? How does this work out in our practical living? Well, how do you represent yourself at work? How do you represent yourself in the community? How do you represent yourself among your friends and your colleagues and, and co-workers and, and those people that you are around. Are you coming across as markedly different from the rest of the world? Or do you look pretty much like them? Because see, in, in our society, you can be a very worldly person and attend church. There are a lot of people that go to church that have not met Christ yet. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of people that attend church because it's a social or a cultural obligation, but they, they, they have not come together to, to, uh, to, with an understanding of relationship with Christ. 
I have a friend that is a pastor in Oklahoma, and he posted something yesterday that, I, that really touched me. And his question was, why church? Why go to church? And his, his answer, I thought, was really cool. He said, because, first of all, church is about relationship. First, the, the incredible relationship that we get to have with our loving Father in heaven, the Almighty God. That we can come together and openly express our love, our gratitude, our devotion to Him. Second, church is about relationship with each other. That, that God has knit together in a tapestry that is beautiful beyond our understanding, the, the, the body of Christ, the, the church, this family that He has knit together. And, and it doesn't even end just here. But it's, it's a universal church. It, it spreads all across the globe. And, and in some parts of it we go, well, they don't look like us, so how can they be part of my family? You should see my siblings. We don't all look the same. We, we have different looks. They have hair. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the first difference you'll notice. Um, they're not as good looking as I am. <laughs> that's the second thing you should notice. <laughs> I'm kidding, siblings. I'm kidding. <laughs> the thing is, God has called us all to a particular place, a particular time, a particular function. We all represent, represent different parts of the body of Christ. And, and you can look at that as an individual. For example, one of us might be a finger and another one an ear. And the ear needs to be scratched so the finger can come in and scratch it. But without the ear, the finger has no idea what's going on around it. And, and you can look at that, and that's how the body works locally. But you can also look at that globally, that our body might be a particular part of the body of Christ. And the, the Baptist church over here across the street is a different part of the body of Christ. We can't look at them and say, oh, you're not a part of the body of Christ because you don't look like an ear. Like we look. And, and we can't tell the Methodist church over here, you're not a part of the body of Christ because you don't look like a finger. So, so there's this understanding that, that God has knit together this, this beautiful thing called the body of Christ, a relationship. And, and when we come to church, we get to participate and be a part of that relationship. Okay? So why church? Primarily because, well, first because God says... Uh, he, he says, I designed it to work this way. This is the way it works best. Okay, But it's about relationship. We, we get to come and have relationship with the Almighty God. We get to come and we get to have relationship with each other. Okay, So coming back to our, our, our message here, our, our passage, it says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, most of my life, I only heard this in relationship to marriage. So a Christian should not marry a non-Christian. And, and I, I absolutely believe that that is true. I believe that to be the case. I believe that if a non-Christian and a Christian marry, they set themselves up for hardship that God does not desire. Okay? I, I believe that God desires that, that Christians should marry Christians. Okay? And if you, you, you can have noble ideas as a Christian going into a marriage with a non-Christian that, well, I'm going to work toward their salvation. You can do that without being married. Okay? So, but... If you notice the context, Paul is not speaking about marriage here. Neither before nor after is he speaking about the husband and wife relationship. He's speaking in a much broader sense. He's speaking in a, a sense of where we dwell, who we, we, we fellowship with, how we engage in life. Now, first, let me re re go back to my, my, my caveat. He's not saying that you can't interact with the world. We have to interact with the world. We're called to interact with the world. But he's saying don't become polluted by the world. Okay? Don't spend so much time with the world that, that, that your fellowship is with them. For what does the light have to do with the darkness? Uh, what does righteousness have to do with lawlessness? See, the thing that we have to get knitted down into our soul is the incredible separation that took place when we left the world and we came to Christ. We ceased to be what they were, and we became what He is. Positional holiness. Okay? 
Now, the walking out of that is where we change our patterns of behavior, where we live this life, and we establish patterns of behavior that were, were abhorrent to God, that God despised, that God rejects, and, and we walk through the path to come over here so that our living reflects what has already taken place in our soul, in our spirit. Okay? So, when we come to Christ, we have to understand that we are a new creation. The old is dead and gone. It does not look and exist anymore. The new has come. Okay? And, and so, we no longer... Go ahead and go to slide two. We no longer are part of the dark. We have come to the light. And, and in order to really grasp this and understand this, we need to understand that those of the dark are enemies of God. Do you understand that? That God opposes them, and that on that day, should they not come to Him, His wrath will be poured out on them. We need to understand that they are His enemies, and as such, they become our enemies. Okay? Now, this is, the, this is the dichotomy of an infinite God that we have to work out in our living. At one and the same time, we reject their behavior. We reject their thinking, their philosophy, their, their lifestyle. But at that same moment, we have to, we are called to love the person. As Christ loved them and gave himself up for them. Now, how do those two things work? Well, that's part of the process of sanctification, working out how that works, how that looks. The thing is, when we have been pulled out from among them, we, we become different. We should look and act different than them. If our friends, if our colleagues, if those people that, that we have been uh, encircled about with us, if, if they cannot tell the difference between before and after, there's a problem, folks. There's, there's a difference. They should be able to go... You're different. How come you don't do this anymore? How come you don't do that anymore? Remember, we used to have such good times when we did these things. But, but you're not really doing these anymore. What is wrong with you? Because they will look at it as being wrong. Okay? Because they don't understand it. It's, it's diff as a matter of fact, it's a stench to them. Okay? They don't like it. It stinks. It's a pleasing aroma to God, but it's a stench to the world. So, how then do we get from the dark to the light? Well, positionally, Christ has already taken us there, but walking out our holiness day to day in everything that we do. Um, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives two illustrations that I, I absolutely love. And on a different day, I'm actually going to do a message just on these two illustrations because... He says an awful lot in these few short verses that, that I think if we dig into, we'll find it so much more rich than it appears at the surface. Okay, so Matthew chapter 5, you see he's doing the Sermon on the Mount. Um, let me flip over there real quick. So I'm going to go, uh, this is immediately after the Beatitudes, uh, which by the way, we'll come back to the Beatitudes. So when we move off from here, you might want to keep your finger there. Um, in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, we're salt, and we're light. Now, salt has three distinct properties. <coughs> Okay. Now there, there are other things that it can be used for, but one, <coughs> it's used to season food, to give it flavor, to add to, okay, to make it something of more than what it was without the salt. Okay. Two, it's a preservative. 
Back then they would take meat and they would pack it in salt. Actually, we, we still do this somewhat today. Pack it in salt so that it preserves the food for a longer time than would be, would be possible without the salt. Okay? And three, it, it actually has medicinal properties where they would actually rub salt in the wounds to help cleanse and purify the wounds. As a matter of fact, at one point, it was, it was actually considered a torture because the process is so painful, they would whip somebody and then they'd rub salt in the wounds to make them hurt more, but what they were actually doing was cleansing the wounds that the healing would take place. Ha ha on them. Um, so salt. We are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall the saltiness be restored? We are salt, and we should be flavorful to the world. They should be able to know that we have flavor. But if our, we do not have flavor before the world, how are they going to know we're salt? What are we? You're monosodium glutamate. You just make me thirsty. Okay? As salt, we should be discernible and definable as salt. Okay? We, when, when we're around people, they should know by the way we comport ourselves, by the way that we talk, the thing and the manner in which we engage with them, they should understand that, that we're different than they are. Okay? So, so going on, it says, uh, if it's lost its saltiness, it's no longer good for anything except for to be thrown out. Then he goes on and he says, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Does your light shine? Does your light shine? When you are out and about in the world, whether you're at work, whether you're uh, at the grocery store, whether you're just going about life, does your light shine in such a way that people know you're different? See, this is, this is part of the process of holiness. Holiness should be readily identifiable. You shouldn't have to dig for it. It should be right there on the surface. It's not something that should be hidden. People don't put a light, in a, a light a lamp and then put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand. Why? So that it will give light to all in the room. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Not unto salvation, but because of salvation. Okay? That's the change that takes place in us. Salvation is a gift of God by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. But when we have salvation, it should birth out of us works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Okay? So um, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. And this leads to their giving glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay? We don't do good works to rub their nose in it. We do good works to bring honor to God. Do you, do you understand that? If you're not doing good works, you're not bringing honor to God before the world. You're not salty. You're, you're lacking in flavor. So what should we look like? When, when people look at a Christian, what should they see? They should see Jesus. But well, what, what does Jesus look like? How do we, we uh, represent Christ to them? Well, Scripture tells us. Scripture actually gives us a number of lists. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Galatians chapter 5. Go ahead and flip there with me if you would. Galatians chapter 5.
I'm going to back up to verse 13 because this kind of ties into the holiness, but the both practical and positional. Um, Paul is writing to the Galatians. Um, if you ever have an opportunity, you want to study the book of Galatians, uh, Mino Kalisher has an incredible book that takes you into in-depth study as to what was going on and what Paul was trying to address. Okay, it has practical application for us today, but there was a very specific issue, issue, series of issues that Paul was dealing with. And, and one of them was that the Galatians who had come to freedom in Christ under the teaching of the gospel had then turned around and enslaved themselves to attempt to fulfill the law, which is an impossibility. Nobody can fulfill the law save Jesus Christ. Okay? So he says, uh, For you were called to freedom, brothers, that that freedom is what salvation is. Uh, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay? So what we're going to see here is black and white. Okay? The world and Christ. Those who are slaves to sin and those who are slaves to righteousness. Okay? So this is, this is how Paul lists it. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay? The law, the Mosaic law, does not hold on to you if you are led by the Spirit. You have been called to a higher law that God has written on your heart. This is what the, the Spirit does. It's the one that leads us into truth and righteousness. Okay? Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? You want to... That's black. Okay? This is the world. This is a, a concise description of what the world looks like. Alright? Those that are in the black, those that are here represented, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, now we step from the dark into the light. Okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit... Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, here's the process of holiness, the process of sanctification, that we learn to walk by His Spirit. That we live in tune with His Spirit, such that when His Spirit says, go this way, this is the way, walk in it, we walk in that way. That we reject those things of the world, and we embrace those things of God. You want to know what the nature and the character of Christ are? Look down here in verses 22 and 23. This is a good summary of the character of Jesus Christ. This is a good summation of the nature of God. Okay? At war, struggling within ourselves... Because we have patterns of behavior, whether it be fits of anger, or our envy, or drunkenness, or immorality, or idolatry. We all have patterns of behavior that are, are opposite to what God has called us to. 
We all have them. That's the areas that we work on. That's the areas that we struggle in. But when you come to Christ, when you have surrendered yourself to Christ, God has gifted you with His Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit that first convicts you of sin. The difference between conviction and condemnation. Okay? Condemnation is unto death. Conviction is unto life. Okay? What I mean by that is if you stand condemned before God, it's unto death. He has rejected you. He has put you out. But as a believer... As a son of God, as a daughter of God, we are no longer condemned, are we? No, we're, we're not condemned. That's, that's for those in the dark. Those in the light do not receive condemnation. However, they will receive conviction. Conviction which leads to life. This is that which the Spirit brings to our attention that needs to be removed from our, our lives that we might walk in holiness. And, and there are some of you that you're going to look at this list and you're going to look at a particular part and go, oh my gosh, that's speaking right to me. And I'm going to look at that particular part and not even understand what that is. But then, a couple words later, I'm going to look at that and go, oh my gosh, he's speaking to me. And you're going to look at that and go, why, why is that even a problem? Well, for you it's not a problem. For me it is. The areas that I struggle with, Christy doesn't struggle with. The areas she struggles with, I don't struggle with. For a long time that caused problems because we'd sit in judgment on each other and go, why? Are you even dealing with this? This is a non-issue. Well, for me, it's a non-issue. I don't particularly struggle in those areas. But for her, it is a big issue. And the Holy Spirit has revealed it to her as a big issue. Who am I to say, don't struggle with this? Okay? So when we look at that, we don't look at these and, and, and qualify them. Well, I'm, I'm glad I've only got this one and not that one. These are all works of the flesh. They're all in the dark. Okay? So, so if you know what, the, the, one, the one that really jumps out to me uh, was, was fits of anger. I'm a Van Note. Van Notes are known for their fits of anger. Okay? God has been working on me for years and years and years and years and years. And He continues to work on me. The fits of anger that I have now are significantly less than what I had then. They're, they're less frequent and they're less intense. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that, that he, he, he made me older and slowed me down so I don't have the energy to sustain that kind of anger anymore. But it's something that he's still dealing with me at, okay? Where, where something will, will bother me and I'll snap. And immediately his spirit is there. Actually, his spirit was there first telling me, don't do it. Don't do it. Walk in patience. Walk self-control. Which seems to be the first thing that goes out the window with me. Actually, that's not true. I become impatient and then I lose control. Okay? But, you know, for some of you, fits of anger may not be an issue. That, that, may, not, that may not address you. But, but some of you may have other areas that you're struggling with. Okay, This is the promise of the Holy Spirit that God would send into us, that He would convict us of sin unto life, that He would then empower us to have victory over that sin. And sometimes it's instantaneous. I know people that when they came to Christ, man, they were instantly delivered of all kinds of things. Drug addictions, alcoholism, I mean all kinds of things. But... but they still had others that they still had to deal with. And, and God had to work through them in. Okay? And so, um, this is, this is the, the, the point I want to get to you today. What I really want you to take away from this today is when we are in Christ, we then become Christ to the world. We are His representatives. We are His ambassadors. We represent Him to the world. We've got to have this kind of well, I don't want to say comparison, I guess contrast. Instead of go back to slide one. Instead of this. If the world can't see us as being different, why would they ever want anything that we have? They've already got everything we have. If, if this is what we're presenting to the world such that we can be friends with the world, first, 
understand that James says that uh, if you have friendship with the world, you're an enemy of God. We don't want to be friends with the world. We don't want to be intimate with the world. We want to go out and be a light to the world. We need to understand that we are marked different than them. That's holiness. We are unique unto God. We are no longer profane. We are no longer common. We're different. We're distinct. And we need to take that, that, that distinctiveness into the world that our light would shine in dark places. And that's having the character of Christ. The character of Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you. You are awesome. God, you are so gracious. You are merciful to us and your loving kindness knows no end. I thank you, Father, that you are patient. That God, when we stumble, you have given us your spirit to bring us back to our feet that we might continue on. I thank you, Lord God, that you have said you would never leave us. You would never forsake us. That we are never alone. And Father, I ask today that you would birth in us a fire. That your spirit would burn in us. That we would not be able to contain those things that you have given us. But Father, we would find ourselves compelled to share with those around us the miraculous things you have done in our life. Father, that we would declare before the congregation, before the great multitude, your praises. Help us, Father, that when we are out in the world and when we are engaging with them, that, Father, we would be light, children of the light. That, Father, even if it is a stench from their nostrils, it would be such a stench as would point them to you. And I ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen us and give us boldness. We bless you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.